The Kalanin K7 was an oddity of massive proportions. In the interwar years, the first attempts were being made at designing huge transports capable of carrying hundreds of passengers. Indeed, between the mid-1920s and up to the start of the Second World War, aircraft manufacturers often entertained themselves by designing things that had no right to being able to fly as well as they did. Enter one Konstantin Kalanin. Born in 1887, he served in the Imperial Russian Air Force during World War I. He would join the Bolsheviks in 1917, continuing his aviation career, and moving into aircraft design in 1925. He designed two high-wing monoplane airliners in the late 1920s, the K-4 and the K-5. Both of these designs were successful, albeit simple, but he was also working on something much, much bigger. Kalanin had worried that he would not be able to sell his design to the relevant persons in the Soviet government. He was concerned that it would fly in the face of certain egalitarian views within the party, and with somebody as paranoid as Stalin at the helm, that concern could prove fatal. However, he persevered, and it was acknowledged that an aircraft so vast and imposing could have wonderful propaganda value, providing it worked. To sweeten the deal, Kalanin also discussed the possibility of the aircraft being used for military use as a bomber, and the administration was sold. Work began on the K-7 in 1931 and took almost two years to complete, with the experimental prototype deemed ready for testing by mid-1933. When completed, the true scale of the project became apparent to everyone. The K-7 had a length of 92 feet, a maximum height of 40 feet, and a colossal wingspan of 174 feet. For comparison, that's roughly double the average wingspan of the popular commercial airliners at the time. The great wing of the K-7 would be the largest elliptical wing ever built, having an area of 4,887 square feet, eclipsing anything coming before or after it in terms of pure surface area alone. A single tail would not have been sufficiently strong enough to support an aircraft of this size, and so the K-7 became one of the first large aircraft designed with a twin boom layout. Like all things with the K-7, this too was massive, with the horizontal tail surface having the same width as the wingspan of a large monoplane fighter of the era. If the wings were considered impressive, then its weight should have been considered terrifying. The K-7 had an empty weight of 24,400 kilograms, which was the equivalent of almost two and a half fully loaded Douglas DC-3 airliners. This weight would then increase further when the K-7 was carrying its intended payload. Nominally, it was designed to carry 120 passengers, or 7,000 kilograms of cargo in its civilian configuration. No small feat, as carrying anything over 60 passengers was considered impressive for the time. The massive wing of the aircraft, with a thickness of 2.3 meters, was thick enough to accommodate this large number of passengers, and even featured forward-facing viewing windows, which would have provided quite the sight when the aircraft was airborne. To support this huge bulk during takeoff and landing, the K-7 needed more than the typical landing gear of the time. Two large undercarriage sponsons were constructed, and they were directly connected to the main airframe through several steel connectors. The sponsons also included two connecting tubes. The one at the rear was vertical and held a ladder, whilst the forward tube was at an angle and contained a small staircase that connected to the wing, allowing for passengers and crew to enter the aircraft. Each of the landing sponsons housed three large wheels, one forward, two aft. The K-7 was manned by a large crew, totalling 19 or 13 people depending on sources. The pilot and command crew were housed in a central gondola that had a vast array of window framing to offer good visibility. The gondola had two tiers, the pilot and co-pilot would be seated at the top, and it looks like the lower tier housed either some sort of navigator or bombardier depending on the configuration. Aside from the basic details, more in-depth information on this aircraft is incredibly sparse, so I will not absolutely state that the lower level was used for those purposes, but it is my educated guess on the matter. The prototype of the K-7 that was built was the military version, and not the civilian aircraft that Kalanin had originally envisioned. In this configuration, a large portion of the 19 crew members would be stationed as gunners. 
Outside the command gondola, there were 12 crew positions scattered around the aircraft, and at least seven of these appeared to be gunner positions. One in the nose, one on each of the tail booms, two on the tail itself, and two each in the landing sponsons, one facing forward and one facing aft. By early 1930s standards, the K-7 had a very heavy defensive armament. It was equipped with at least eight 7.62mm machine guns and at least three 20mm cannons. As far as I can tell, the cannons were mounted in the three forward firing positions, one being the nose and the other two being in the front of the landing gear sponsons, whilst machine guns were in the central and rear positions. Gun for gun, this meant that the K-7 had more firepower than any other bomber at the time, and along with its sheer size would have made it a very tough nut to crack, as almost all aircraft at the time lacked cannons in their main armament. In this military configuration, the passenger compartments were replaced by a series of integrated bomb bays. At full capacity, the K-7 would be able to carry up to 19,000 kilograms of bombs, once again eclipsing any other aircraft at the time, and many more in the future. Again, for comparison's sake, the maximum payload for a B-17 would only be 7,800 kilograms, and the B-29 could just manage 10,000 kilograms, excluding the Grand Slam bombs. To shift this vast bulk, the K-7 had originally been designed with six 47-litre Mikulin AM34 V12 engines, each producing 750 horsepower. They were housed in three nacelles on the leading edge of the wing, on either side of the cockpit. However, it was determined that even the combined power of six engines wasn't enough, and two more were coupled together to drive a single propeller in a pusher position at the rear of the aircraft between the tail booms. The aircraft was designed for a maximum speed of 140 miles an hour, and a relatively low surface ceiling of 13,000 feet. The K-7 took to the skies for the first time on August the 11th, 1933. Unfortunately, the addition of the rear-facing engine caused severe issues for the K-7. On the first test flight, it showed serious instability due to alarmingly strong vibrations in the tail booms, and it was noted that the airframe seemed to be resonating with the frequency of the engines, and this was made worse by the extra turbulence created by the pusher propeller at the back. The relationship between natural frequencies of structures and vibrations was not fully understood in the 1930s, and so the only solution for the problem that seemed to work was shortening the tail booms and welding on steel strengthening plates. After these modifications were made, the aircraft continued on to perform several more test flights. It was hailed as a huge propaganda success, not only from a technological standpoint, but from a production standpoint as well. The K-7 was the first major aircraft produced with Soviet-made steel, as all previous aircraft had been built with imported materials. Russian newspaper Pravda declared it was a victory of the utmost political importance, proving that the new Soviet state was on its way to becoming a fully self-sufficient industrial power. Unfortunately, the victory would be short-lived. Not long after this, the K-7 would take off for the last time on November the 21st, 1933. It was not long into the flight when the aircraft was at around 350 feet that the right tail boom separated from the plane. Without the lateral stability provided by the tail, it entered into a powered dive, crashing into the ground at almost full power. Fifteen of the twenty people aboard were killed, as was one person on the ground. No photos exist of the crash, and there is not a great deal of information about it either probably due to the Stalinist level of secrecy that pervaded the Soviet media at the time. Some suggest that the resonance issues caused by the engines had not been completely fixed, which led to an inevitable failure of the airframe. This theory seems to hold up well enough and matches with witness accounts from the crash, but there is also the theory of sabotage. The K-7 had inspired the development of another Russian monster, the uh, Tupolev ANT-20, which was, in theory, its direct competition. There was speculation in the aviation press that the large aviation company had sabotaged its smaller but impressive competitor. However, the true course will likely remain unknown. Two more K-7s had been ordered, but the project was cancelled and the prototypes scrapped in 1935. 
Konstantin Kalanin would go on to design other aircraft, but he would never eclipse his grandest design. By the late 1930s, he had gotten on the bad side of Stalin, and he was executed as an enemy of the state during Stalin's purges in 1938. The K-7 is an aircraft that we really don't know much about, but I would just like to point out a rather large myth that has developed around this aircraft over the years. The myth about the K-7 was that it was somehow designed to be equipped with the heavy guns found on a naval warship. No doubt this was started by this photoshopped image that can be found readily on the internet. Despite its insanity, this idea has somehow caught on in certain circles. Now this is a completely unrealistic design. The weight of just one of the two turrets you see here would be enough to ground the aircraft and prevent it from taking off at all. Even then, the recoil of firing six 250mm guns on an airframe like this would cause catastrophic structural failure after the first discharge. The ability for the K-7 to be able to carry its theorised bomb load of 19 tonnes is also questioned. For its size, it's theoretically possible to fit that weight of bombs in the aircraft, but there are many who doubt the aircraft's ability to actually lift said bombs off the ground. The K-7 struggled enough in test flights, and that was with only a few extra tonnes more than its dry weight, let alone 19 tonnes. In the end, there just isn't enough information readily available. Like the man who developed it, a lot of the details about this aircraft were lost in the purges. All we are left with is a handful of grainy photos and sketches, along with a humbling sense of wonder that this giant aircraft took to the skies only 30 years after the Wright brothers' first flight.